morning. Well, welcome to HPC this morning. Today we have the pleasure of having Pastor Danny Peters back with us. <laughs> now before he gets up here and does our call to worship, there are a few announcements. So our first announcement is that we are at $288,543 for our roof project. That is amazing. <laughs> In our next, we're going to have an outdoor worship service followed by a barbecue on Sunday, August 18th. There'll be more information to come, and if you would like to come, bring a lawn chair. We're going to have it outside, and it'll be beautiful weather, and we've invited the other congregations to come and join us. So please join us on August 18th. Comfort quilts. So we have two comfort quilts that we would like everybody to help sign today after worship. They will be in the fellowship hall on the tables. One is for Dave Radcliffe. This one is for Dave Radcliffe. And the other one is for Jill Cessna. So if you would like to come and sign these beautiful quilts, they will be on a table in the fellowship hall after service. And then also, as a reminder, we don't pass the plate anymore. We have a box in the back. You can either scan on your phone the QR code if you'd like to give, or you, there's envelopes that you can give and put it in the box in the back. So thank you, and I'd like to welcome Danny Peters. Well, good morning, church. Good morning. It's uh, good to be back among you today. I was here a few months ago, back in April, and it's good to be back. I was really delighted when uh, Pastor Kelly reached out and invited me to come back and teach. I'll be here next week as well, so looking forward to that as well. So um, if you haven't met me, my name is Danny. I am a minister member of the Cascades Presbytery, currently serving as a hospital chaplain in the area. I work at Providence Hospital over in Oregon City. And I live not too far from here, a couple towns over in, uh, in Tigard, so it's, uh, it's always a blessing to be, uh, to be with you as we worship our Lord together. And let's uh, take a moment now, I invite you to rise in body or in spirit, and join me in this morning's call to worship. In moments of anxiety, God leads us to still waters. Oh God, we come to you. In moments of confusion, God leads us in right paths. Oh God, we come to hear your voice. In moments of loneliness, God is with us. Oh God, we come seeking your love. In all our moments, God is with us. So we come to praise the one who restores our lives. Let us worship God. You know, friends, God can do anything but fail. Yeah. Think of that. Yeah. God is good all, all the time. time. And all the time, God, God is, is good. good. Amen.
Let us pray. God, our maker, in summer we marvel at the world you have made, the colors of sunrise and sunset filling, filling the horizon, the intricate beauty of flower gardens and natural parks, the quiet dignity of a river in its course, and the steadfast presence of a rock face carved over time. You show us how each small piece of your creation depends in many ways on all the others, the quality of life on the respect we offer each other. God, our maker, we join all creation to bring you praise, honoring you and the relationships you have set between us all. Through Christ, firstborn of all creation, amen. Please join in singing hymn number 396 in the purple hymnal. This may not have a real uh, familiar title, but it is a very familiar hymn tune, and so it fits our service today. Join us. be seated. The proof of God's amazing love is this. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Because we have faith in him, we dare to approach God with confidence in honest repentance. Let us confess our sin before God and one another, first in corporate prayer and then in silent confession. God, our maker, though we marvel at your creation, we confess we often take it for granted. We prefer to live as if our lifestyles make no impact on the earth. We resist reports that tell us otherwise. We confess we don't really want to change, yet we wonder if the way we live pleases you. Forgive us for any harm we cause the earth. Teach us how to live with love and respect for you and your whole creation.
Jesus calmed the seas, saying, Peace, be still. Similarly, Jesus speaks over the storms of our lives, calling forth peace from the chaos that previously swirled. Let us receive the peace and forgiveness of Christ, not because of anything we have done, but because of the grace that pursues us in Christ Jesus. We have been forgiven and are free from the chaos of the sin that so easily entangles. Thanks be to God. Friends, the peace of the Lord be always with you. Psalm 29, verse 11 says this, that the Lord blesses his children with peace, that this is a gift that God longs to pour into our world and into our lives. And we have this moment in worship to be able to acknowledge that, to celebrate that, and to share that with one another. Uh, so at this point, I, I invite you to, to do just that, to share the peace of Christ with each other. So let's take a moment. I invite you to rise if you are able. Let's take a moment and share the peace of Christ with those who are joining us virtually. Uh, if you're joining us on online, thank you for being here, and we pray God's peace upon you um, wherever you may be. And now I invite you all that are here in the room to take a moment and greet your neighbor and share the peace of our Lord Jesus. Peace, 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 peace. <laughs> <laughs>
Let us prepare our hearts and minds to hear God's word as we pray. Send us your Holy Spirit, O God, to prepare us to receive your word today. Silence in us any voice but your own, that hearing you, we may obey your will and follow your ways in the example of Jesus Christ, the living word. Amen. Our scripture reading today is John 10, 11 to 18, found on pages 1666 to 1667 in your pew Bible. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. The hired hand is not the shepherd and does not own the sheep. So when he sees the wolf coming, he abandons the sheep and runs away. Then the wolf attacks the flock and scatters it. The man runs away because he is a hired hand and cares nothing for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep and my sheep know me. Just as the Father knows me, and I know the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. I have other sheep that are not of this sheep pen. I must bring them also. They too will listen to my voice, and there shall be one flock and one shepherd. The reason my Father loves me is I lay down my life only to take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down and authority to take it up again. This command I received from my Father. This is the word of the Lord. Well, throughout the summer, I understand that you all have been looking intently at the book of Psalms. And in the Psalms, we have an absolute treasure. They have an amazing capacity to lead us into a deeper communion uh, with our God. And for today and next Sunday as well, uh, we are going to be opening up to Psalm 23, which very well be the may be the, the most cross-stitched Bible passage of, of all time. It's one that we know quite well, a very beloved passage. And I'm going to read that text for us now. So let's take a moment. Let's take a moment to quiet our minds and our hearts as we, as we receive what God has for us today. The church here, the promises of God. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, and my cup overflows. Surely, goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. <coughs> this is the word of the Lord. Amen. Thanks be to God. Years ago, I had just been called to my first church. I was a 
recent seminary graduate in my middle 20s who thought that I knew something about being a pastor, but in actuality, I had no clue. And I remember very early on, I, I had an experience. I received a phone call. It's, I think this might have been actually my first week um, at the church, and I, I received a phone call uh, that one of our members was critically ill in the hospital and uh, in the active dying process, and the family asked if I would come and, and pay a visit. And so I, I arrived at the hospital, and, and I um, found my way to the room, and I met this grieving family. I'd never met them before. They had never met me, and I, I was in that space with them, and, and after some time of what I would call some uncomfortable silence, one of the family members looked at me and said, uh, Pastor, would you say a few words? And one might assume that after three years of advanced theological study that maybe I would, maybe I would know what to do in this situation, but in, in reality, I, I didn't. No, and I stood there um, amongst this grieving family in the presence of this person who was in their final hours of life, and I reached for the only words that I could think to say, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. And since then, I have read this passage at I don't know how many memorial services. Uh, this is our perception, I think, often of this psalm, that we find it to be most relevant in times of trial and of crisis. We reach for it when life gets messy and when life gets painful. And, th and this is a good thing, because these words are very relevant in those moments. These words have the capacity to be a, a healing balm for the soul. But more than that, more than that, friends, Psalm 23, these are words for daily living. So I, I want us to resist maybe giving this psalm kind of the label of kind of the funeral psalm. Because in reality, it is far more than that. Psalm 23 is words for daily living. And, and there's something that happens whenever we hear this text. Because like I said earlier, this is a very familiar passage to many of us. For those of us that might have been around the church for a long time or maybe even our whole lives, it's a very familiar text to us. And that's not always a good thing. Uh, I think about this passage in Mark chapter 6. It's a, a text where Jesus comes to his hometown, the town of Nazareth. And when he comes to his hometown, it says that the people there were not able to hear or receive his message. And the reason was they were much too familiar with Jesus. They had watched him grow up. They knew him quite well. So when he began his ministry and came back to Nazareth, they could not hear the gospel message that he was proclaiming. And they could not recognize him for who he truly was, which was the son of God. Familiar, familiarity is not always a good thing. So I want to name that as we get into this passage and really just say that for today and for next Sunday, my, my hope is that the Holy Spirit will breathe new life into this text, that we might be able to hear it with fresh ears, see it with fresh eyes. But for this morning, what I want to do is I want to reflect primarily on the first verse of this text, which is, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. These words are attributed to King David, who, before being anointed as king of Israel, he himself was a, a shepherd boy. And now in the context of prayer and worship in Psalm 23, David is moved to proclaim, the Lord is my shepherd. And this is an image of God that can be traced through the entire biblical witness, Old Testament and the New. We just heard that text a moment ago from John chapter 10 where Jesus picks this up when he says to, to his people, I am the good shepherd. So this idea of God as shepherd, it is foundational to the biblical story. But the first thing I want us to consider is this, that if this is true, that if God really is shepherd, then what does that make us? <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> 
You know, as a kid, I had a pretty, pretty rural upbringing. I, I grew up uh, kind of out in, the, out in the country, in the farmlands of Central Valley, California. And I remember when I was growing up, our, our, our immediate neighbors had this big field, this pasture, that was always like this revolving door of farm animals. Like for a while, it was goats, and then it was, you know, donkeys, horses. For once, it was just a pack of turkeys. Those were the worst, I tell you what. <laughs> Uh, but for a while, they, they had sheep um, in their pasture, and I, and I remember the sheep quite well. So I remember there was this one day, I was pretty young, I was maybe about 12 years old, where I went outside, and I hear one of the sheep just making just this horrifying noise. And, and I go over, and, and, I, and I check out what's going on, and, and I see one of them there, kind of at the base of the fence with its head stuck in there. Like, it's gotten his head lodged in there and couldn't get free, and so I went and I... Yeah, it looked, some, it looked something like that, um, minus the open gate on the, on the side. Uh, but I, I remember uh, just going and just finding like a pair of gloves, because I don't know if these things bite or what. So I'm, and I go and I kind of pull back the wires and just kind of stick his head right out. And, you know, I felt pretty good. I felt like I had done my good deed for the day. But I, t I t kid you not, like five minutes later, I, I hear the exact same sheep making the exact same noise, and I go over, and he's gotten his head stuck in the exact same spot. I'm like, oh, jeez, come on. And this is about my, the extent of my experience with, with sheep, but from what I can tell, I mean, they're, they're just not that good at life. <laughs> and, and, and yet throughout the entire Bible, through the whole biblical witness, the people of God are constantly referred to as sheep. Isaiah 53 says that all of us, like sheep, have gone astray. Ezekiel 34, God says that you are my flock, the sheep of my pasture. Mark chapter 6, Jesus, it says that Jesus sees the people and he has compassion for them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. So the fact that we are called sheep, metaphorically speaking, in the Bible, I mean, that ought to humble us quite a bit. Because sheep are by nature impulsive and clumsy and all of those things, <coughs> W. Philip Keller wrote a classic book called A Shepherd's Look at Psalm 23. And he wrote this book from a very unique perspective because he is, in fact, a shepherd. That's what he does for a living. And I think we have this quote for the, for the screen, but I wanted to read it for us. He writes, It is no accident that God has chosen to call us sheep. The behavior of sheep and human beings is similar in many ways. Our mass mind, mob instincts, our fears and timidity, our stubbornness and stupidity, our perverse habits are all parallels of profound importance. Yet despite these adverse characteristics, Christ chooses us, buys us, calls us by name, makes us his own, and delights in caring for us. Hallelujah. Amen. So church, despite our way waywardness, and despite our, our clumsiness and our rebellion, the Lord is and forever will be our shepherd the, who pursues us with his love and his grace and his compassion because we know the story, right? That the Lord is the one. And Jesus told a story about this, right? That he is the one who leaves the 99 and goes after that one sheep, that one who has gone astray. The Lord is our shepherd. And we like that part of the psalm, don't we? It sounds, it sounds really good. But the next few words may hit us a little bit different. The Lord is my shepherd, and therefore, I shall not want. Or a better translation is maybe to say, the Lord is my shepherd, and therefore, there is nothing that I lack. If the Lord is my shepherd, I don't need anything else. Author Dallas Willard says that this verse describes a life that we all want, but few of us actually live as though it were true. 
I don't know about you, I, I, I'm guessing that uh, many of you can join me in this, but, uh, but I struggle with that. The struggle with, with feeling that just that deep sense of contentment and, and satisfaction in life. Gosh, boy, do I want that. Boy, do I want to live with that mentality that says, Lord, if I have you in my life, I, I'm good. I don't, need, I don't need anything else. But it is amazing how often I find myself in a space of want and, and amazing how often that I found my, find myself bowing down at the, at the altar of the American dream of the, the, the good house and the safe neighborhood, a comfortable life and good investments and good savings and all of these things. I long, my heart longs for the comfort and the, and the security of this world. But the, but the fact is that the things of this world make terrible masters. So you see, with Psalm 23, verse 1, we're, we're caught between these two realities. That on the one hand, we have God, who is our faithful Lord and our good shepherd. And on the other hand, there are the, the mesmerizing voices of our world and our culture that seek to convince us that, that we lack. Uh, Harold Kushner, I think, uh, I think puts it very well. We have this uh, quote for the screen as well. He says, there is a part of me that wants to want, despite the words of our psalm. There is a part of me that, never, that wants never to be satisfied with who I am and what I have achieved. I believe that God has planted in every one of us the desire for more and the reluctance to settle for what we have and what we are with all of its ambivalence. But our challenge is to want more of the right things. Our challenge is to want more of the right things. I, sum, I think that sums it up quite well, because when you think about it, this really is the, the story of Genesis 3 and humanity's fall into sin, that we began to want the wrong things. Church, the truth is that Jesus is the only master, the only shepherd who is faithful, the only one who truly satisfies the deep longings of our hearts. When we put something else in the place of the good shepherd, and I think we know this, but that is a path that only leads us into bondage, when in fact Jesus seeks to lead us into greater wholeness and peace and freedom. And more than that, he is the one who lays down his life for the sheep. He is the one who sustains us and cares for us and holds us up with his faithful love. I want to close us uh, with this story. Uh, when, I was in, when I was in seminary, I had a professor who, uh, prior to uh, being in academia, was a Lutheran pastor, and he had served churches for many years before going into teaching. And I, and I remember very well a story that he once told about serving communion in his congregation. You see, in his church, it was uh, customary for the Lord's Supper to be served every Sunday. And so each and every week, he would notice a man who would always come into worship very consistently, very faithfully. And he would sit kind of in the back corner of the sanctuary. And he began to notice that every week when the, uh, when the community came forward to receive the, the Eucharist, that this man would remain in his seat. He, he would never come forward. And so this pastor uh, approached this, this man about, about why, why that was. He, he wanted him to know that you're, you're welcome to, to come, that, that if you are longing for the, for the grace and mercy of Jesus, you, you are welcome at, at this table. And this man told, told this pastor that he didn't feel, he didn't feel worthy. Um, he, he felt that his, his faith wasn't strong enough, that maybe he had too many doubts or... And, and also felt as though there, there were things in his life that maybe disqualified him for coming to the table of Jesus. And so every week, 
uh, my professor would pray for this man, that, that the Holy Spirit would, would, would move in his heart, uh, that, that maybe one Sunday he would, he would stand up and he would come forward and that he would receive the bread and the cup and uh, that, that, he would, uh, that he would know just how deeply he is loved by the Father. But still, every single week, the community meal would be served and the man would stay right there in his seat until one day my, my professor, his pastor, to, took a different approach. And when it came time for, for communion, he himself grabbed a couple of plates and he walked to the back of the sanctuary and he came and stood right in front of this man and... Uh, and he said, open your mouth. And he took a piece of bread and just, <laughs> just stuck it right in his mouth. He said, open your mouth again. Took one of those you know, little cups of juice and just <laughs> stuck it right in his mouth. Yeah, I'd never heard of force-feeding communion before. <laughs> yeah, I, I've never been so bold. I, it's, um, it's, it's very, it's very, uh, very unique uh, approach. And as you can imagine, after, after worship, this man came up to the pastor. Pastor, I, I told you, I told you that I did not want to come forward for the meal. Why? Why did you do that? And this young pastor simply replied, because Jesus goes after people just like you. Amen. And I want to leave you with that bit of good news today. I mean, I don't, I don't know you. I, I don't know what you're bringing with you into, into worship today. But I know that it's true for all of us there that we can be, be pretty, pretty dang clumsy in our walk with God. I know it's true that we are prone to wander, that we are prone to, uh, to repeat the same destructive cycles again and again, all of, that is, all of that is true. Like sheep, we have all gone astray, but a greater truth is this, that Jesus is the good shepherd who lays down his life for the sheep. This Jesus, friends, this Jesus goes after people just like you. To God our Father be the glory forever and ever. Amen. Would you pray with me? Holy and gracious God, we just give you such great thanks for, for this reality that you have chosen to be the good shepherd who lays down your life for the sheep. Thank you, God. Thank you, God, for your goodness and faithfulness to us. Thank you for pursuing us with your great love. Thank you, God, that in this world that there is nothing. There is nothing in this world that can separate us from your great love in Christ Jesus, our Lord. It's in his name, Father, that we pray. As the, as the people of God, we are, we are called to pray. 
We are called to pray not only for our own needs, but for one another, for our city, and for this world in which we live. So let's, uh, let's take a moment and let's, uh, let's join our hearts together as we go before the throne of God in a, in a moment of prayer. Heavenly Father, we, we take a moment to, to rest in, in the reality that, that you love us enough to die for us. And we humbly ask your, your forgiveness for moments in our lives when we forget that. For moments in our lives when we, when we don't trust your voice and we listen to the, the mesmerizing voices of this world, Lord, forgive us. And we know that you are a God who, who longs to welcome us back into your presence, that you want nothing more, that you want nothing more than for your children to come home. So God, mindful of your great love, we, we pray for this church and we pray for its people. We pray for all of those who are in this room, for, for those who are not and call this place home, and for anyone who might be joining us virtually today. God, we ask that your grace and your mercy and your favor would rest upon this place. We pray in particular for those who are enduring challenging times, for those who find themselves in, in the dark valley, as Psalm 23 might say. We pray for those who are battling illness, those who are battling depression, for those who are suffering in body or in, in mind or in spirit. God, would your faithful love continue to rest upon this congregation? God, would you build up this community as an outpost of your, of your kingdom? And looking beyond our walls, we pray for the city of Hillsborough, and we pray for its leaders, and we pray for its people. We pray in particular for, the, for those who are vulnerable. We, we play, pray for those who, who, don't have, who don't have enough. Uh, enough food, uh, enough, enough shelter, enough hope, enough joy. God, we hold up this city to you, remembering that you are, are present, not only here in this place, but in every place that we find ourselves in the coming days. And God, we, we pray for our country and for this world. We pray in particular uh, for our for our country that is bent under the, the weight of violence and oppression, political violence and division and turmoil and all of these things. God, we ask that you would keep us firmly anchored in the hope that is found in Jesus, that no matter what the headlines might say, God, that you would bring to our minds an awareness that of what you are doing, that you are reconciling this whole world back to yourself. We believe that, Lord. We believe that that is the work that you are doing in this world, even in moments, even on days when it's hard to see. God, so give us faith and give us a steadfast hope and give us the courage and the capacity to, to be salt and light in this world. To be love, to be mercy, to be compassion for a world that is hurting and in desperate need of such things. God, we thank you that we, you have called us, that you have called us for a moment just like this. God, that you have given us your Holy Spirit. You have not left us. God, but you are here you are here with with power so we ask god that you would equip us that you would continue to shape and mold us into the people that you would have us to be and would you 
would you continue to shape and transform our lives and make us more like Jesus? And it's in his name, Father, that we pray and we join now our hearts and our voices saying in a prayer that he taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. church, as you, as you go from this place, go with the knowledge that Jesus goes after people just like you. And this week and in the days to come and forevermore, may you know the love of God. May you know the grace and mercy of our Lord Jesus, and may you know the fellowship of the Holy Spirit. Friends, the one who calls us is faithful, and God will do it. And all of God's people said, Amen. Amen.